This is the Voice of America, Washington, D.C., signing on. This is VOA News. June 30th, 2014 is a momentous day for the Voice of America. All shortwave broadcasts for English news programs to Asia will be eliminated. We will no longer be heard via shortwave in the morning, said someone from the Broadcasting Board of Governors. Shortwave frequencies to the following services will also be eliminated. Azerbaijani, Bangal, English Learning, Tamir, Kurdish, Lao, and Uzbek. Shortwave services being used by Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, and Radio Free Asia will also be cut. When contacted, the Broadcasting Board of Governors had this to say. How sweet to be an idiot. They added, because shortwave has been a cheap and effective way to receive communications in countries with poor infrastructure or repressive regimes, it was a good way to deliver information. But broadcasting via shortwave is expensive, and its listeners have been in the decline for years. The BBG was asked to comment on this. <laughs> We're now joined by David Enzor, the director of The Voice of America. David, let me ask you the question. I mean, if, if the VOA's objective is to reach audiences that have very poor infrastructure and repressive regimes where the Internet is not an option, either it's not working or there's no Internet at all, how will, will the audience be able to continue listening to VOA broadcasts? <laughs> <laughs> so what you're saying then is listeners will have to go to the VOA website, voanews.com, but if they can't access this information, what is the point of voanews.com being there? <laughs> <laughs> now the Broadcasting Board of Governors said they want to break the news on Sunday night and they don't want specific frequencies uh, to, to be announced on the air. Is, is there any reason for that to wait right till the last moment? <laughs> Thank you very much, David Enzor, the director of The Voice of America. In Washington, I'm Ishka Bibble. We now join our regular scheduled broadcast already in progress. Hey, what kind of organization do you think this is? How dare you go on air and read something like that? You know what? You're out of here. You're fired like there's no tomorrow.
stehen. Und denen wird mehr gefordert als von den Millionen der übrigen Volksgenossen. Für sie genügt nicht die bloße Ablegung des Bekenntnisses. getting legitimacy to our chief executive, because without a popular mandate, this government is finding it more and more difficult to govern Hong Kong effectively. And if they cannot govern Hong Kong effectively, it affects not just the average man in the street, but the business, entire business community. A man who was one of the most powerful and feared in China has vanished from public life. Xiao Yong Kang oversaw China's vast internal security network before retiring in late 2012. But Mr. Zhao hasn't been seen for many months, and rumors are swirling that he's been caught up in the Chinese president's anti-corruption campaign. Hui Fan Tei reports from Wuxi in China. A tiny village in the outskirts of Wuxi, in China's southeast, is attracting a steady stream of visitors, even though there's nothing much to see. They are interested in one of the houses here because it's the family home of Zhou Yongkang the man formerly in charge of China's domestic security. In China, this portfolio officially receives even more money than defense. A group of workers resting opposite the famous house are puzzled by the attention. They come from everywhere, says this man. They even come from Shanghai, says the woman next to him. People are speculating about the whereabouts of Zhou Yongkang because he's disappeared from public life. There are rumors about his alleged involvement in corruption. These intensified in recent months after a high-level Communist Party official, Liu Xinhua, did nothing to play down speculation. Our serious investigation and punishment of party members and cadres, including some senior officials, indicates that what we stated was not empty words, he says. What's the land? I can only say so much so far. You know what I'm saying. There's no official announcement regarding any charges or even an investigation into Zhou Yongkang. But that hasn't stopped people from talking about his possible fate because Zhou Yongkang oversaw the detention of so many others. He was one of China's most powerful men. Zhou Yongkang is a figure in Chinese political society, a person of standing, says this man who had just arrived from a city nearby. And then, as he walked away, the man turned around and added, I don't think he'll be in deep trouble. There has been international condemnation of the court decision in Egypt, which handed jail terms to three journalists, including Australian Peter Grester. The three Al Jazeera correspondents were given seven to ten years imprisonment for their alleged support of the banned Muslim Brotherhood. Foreign governments in Australia, Europe and the US have criticized the rulings amid calls for Egypt's president to intervene. Hayden Cooper, who was in the courtroom in Cairo, reports. There was no way to truly prepare for this bitter blow. As the judge read out the defendant's names, Peter Grister, Muhammad Fahmy and Baha Muhammad huddled together in the cage. Jail for seven years was the verdict, ten for Baha Muhammad. The courtroom exploded in an outpouring of disbelief, shock, anger and grief as the defendants started chanting and shouting. Peter Grister gave a blank stare into the courtroom before smashing his palms against the wire cage. His brothers Mike and Andrew sat stone-faced. With his head in his hands, Mike Grester called the decision the death of Egypt's democracy. I don't know how the judge came to that decision. I'd be very interested to, to hear his, his reasons for giving that verdict. It doesn't make any sense. His brother Andrew had only flown in that morning. Before the hearing, they seemed nervous but confident. Peter was waving at them, giving the thumbs up. So the severe sentence was a shock. Obviously, he'll be shattered as well. It was uh, definitely a... I'm sure it wasn't an outcome that he was expecting. Um, 
he's remained positive throughout this whole process that in the end uh, justice will prevail and the right thing will be done. He's not going to give up either. There's no way he's going to give up. And we won't give up as a family. This decision by Judge Muhammad Shahata echoed around the world. Egyptian ambassadors are being called in for a dressing down by at least three foreign governments, Australia, the UK and the Netherlands. US Secretary of State John Kerry called the sentences chilling and draconian. Uh, I was so concerned about it and frankly disappointed in it that I immediately picked up the telephone and I talked to the foreign minister of Egypt and I registered. Uh, our serious displeasure. After the verdict, amid the pandemonium, Peter Grester was led out of the cage and back to Torah prison. His colleague, Mohammed Fahmy, had to be dragged away by police. The families headed home distraught. Fahmy's mother was inconsolable. Seven years, he was, he was in the prison seven years. For what? Can you, one of you, tell me for what? That's all we have time for today. For more information on the region, visit our website www.pcjmedia.com slash FAP. For PCJ Radio International, I'm Andy Sennett. India, mysterious and mythical. <laughs> Its culture can only be described as incredible. For more information on India, its sites and its culture, visit www.incredibleindia.org. That's www.incredibleindia.org. The British DX Club is one of the world's leading DX clubs with hundreds of members both in the UK and around the globe. BDXC produce a comprehensive monthly magazine called Communication, covering all aspects of the DXing hobby. The BDXC Audio Circle is also available and is a monthly program of DX catches and general chat about radio. For more information, please write to the British DX Club, 10 Hemdean Hill, Caversham, Reading, RG4, 7SB, in the United Kingdom, or visit the website at www.bdxc.org.uk. That's www.bdxc.org.uk. This is PCJ Radio International.
Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome again to another edition of your Sunday program. Of course, happy station. I'm Keith Pell here with you for the next little while, bringing you some music, some chit chat, and also part four of our radio docudrama series, Tales of Dutch Formosa. Today is the final installment. Now, I'm going to be telling you about a special, a couple of special shows that are coming up in July. That'll be on July 6th and July 13th. Now, that actually, those, those two specials are for those who listen to the version of this show on shortwave, but I'll tell you about that at the end of today's show. But let's begin with music right away. The House Martins and The World's on Fire. on fire, the House Martins. All right, we now go to part four, the final part of our four-part docudrama series, Tales of Dutch Formosa. And then when we come back, some information about a couple of shows in the month of July. So sit back and enjoy. Tales of Dutch Formosa. Part 4. By this we abide. In 1644, an invading Tartar army overran northern China, defeated the ruling Ming Emperor, and installed the first Qing Emperor on the imperial throne. Far to the south, however, beyond the immediate control of the victorious Tartars, the vital coastal provinces of Amoy and Fujian 
remained in the hands of a warlord who swore defiance to the new dynasty. This warlord was General Zhen Songgong, known to the Dutch as Prince Koxinga. In 1657, Koxinga shut down the main trade routes out of Fujian, and the VOC governor in Formosa, Frederick Koyet, was obliged to negotiate a new trade treaty that allowed Koxinga to levy taxes. In return, Koxinga allowed the VOC to export 15 million pieces of prized Ming porcelain through Formosa over the next three years. Koxinga then fell sick from a mysterious illness, and as a special favor, he asked for Governor Koyet's personal surgeon, Dr. Christian Baer, to attend to him in Amoy. Now, some months later, Dr. Baer returns to Formosa. He is met in the council chamber of Castle Zelandia by Governor Coyet and Chief Merchant Thomas Iberin. Christian, welcome home. Thank you, Governor. I don't think you've met our new Chief Merchant, Mr. Thomas Iberin. How do you do, Chief Iberin? Dr. Bayer, congratulations on your safe return. After six months at Coxinger's court in Amoy, it's good to be among friends again. But Prince Coxinger is also our friend. Dr. Baer. He may for the present be our ally, Chief Martin, but I should not want to call a man like that my friend. Indeed. Were you not well treated, Christian? I was treated well enough, Governor. But the Prince himself is one of the strangest devils I've ever met, and one of the cruelest as well. He thinks nothing of executing a concubine who displeases him. As a patient, he was impossible. He trusts no one. Not once did he let me properly examine him. And he made me prepare all my medicines in front of him, all the time watching me like a hawk. Oh, you condemn the man for mere prudence, Doctor. Coxinga has many enemies. No, Chief Merchant, I'm afraid you don't understand. This was the mistrustfulness of a madman. Then madness? Is this your diagnosis, Christian? Partly, Governor, yes. For his part, Coxinga insists that he suffers from what the Chinese call the cold winds, and nobody dares contradict him. Not even you, Doctor? Not while I was in his court, Chief Merchant, but I'll willingly contradict him now. In my opinion, this prince of the dynastic surname has an advanced case of syphilis. And I'm afraid that the dementia associated with this disease, not to mention a man's boundless vanity, has created in him a dangerous obsession with his own great destiny. Christian, if he's as deranged as you say, would he be capable of mounting an attack against us here in Formosa? I fear so, Governor, yes. For all his personal failings, the Prince does have his public strengths. I confess I've rarely seen such a well-disciplined army, and his administration is a model of efficiency and ruthlessness. You know, he routinely extorts silver from the Chinese merchants. I see. I'm sorry to add to your troubles, Governor. Governor, this is but one man's opinion. An opinion I value highly, Thomas. In any case, my apprehension does not spring from Christian's words alone. Our spies tell us that the Chinese cabezas have long been encouraging Toxinger to attack. You mean the Chinese headman? Ah, these are rumors, nothing more. The siege ladders they were making lend a worrying substance to these rumors. The Chinese workers have been sending their possessions back to the mainland. No trading junks have arrived for months. Very well. So be it. It is folly to hope any longer. We must prepare for the worst. So, against my advice, You'll send to Batavia for reinforcements? I must, Thomas. If Coxinger invades, we'll need all the ships and men they can spare. The Governor-General will not be pleased. As peace continues to hold, the Governor-General in Batavia is reluctant to divert resources to Formosa. Eventually, however, he sends 700 men in 12 ships under the command of Captain John Vanderland. Vanderland has orders to attack Macau if he finds that these troops are not needed in Formosa. Since Vanderland is interested only in the riches of Macau, as soon as he reaches Zealandia, he concludes that Governor Coyette has too many men rather than too few. He asks the governor for additional troops to aid in the planned attack on Macau, but Governor Coyette and the council refuse his request. Vanderland is indignant. He invites Captain Padel, Sergeant Stockert, and several other officers from the castle 
to join him in the stateroom of the Dutch ship Virgos to further discuss the matter. Well, gentlemen, you've all heard how the council voted against me today and refused my request for help in attacking Macau. Now, I know that none of you gentlemen was to blame, and I've asked you here tonight because... because I've a proposition for you. Uh, but first, another toast to Portuguese wine, women, and gold. Uh, especially the gold. Especially the wine. Especially the women. <laughs> uh, that's the way. You're a gentleman after my own heart. I can tell. Perhaps we are, John. But don't be too sure of us just yet. Let's hear your proposition. Uh, fairly said, Captain. Uh, so help yourself now to this good rum and listen close. Uh, you gentlemen know as well as me that there's plunder enough to be had from the Portuguese in Macau. Uh, I stopped there on my way here, pretended I need to take on more water. Uh, you can be sure I had a good look around. And what did I find? Why, that with a few more men, we can take the place easy. Oh. And with all that gold, we wouldn't have to wait until we're too old to enjoy our company pensions, eh? Aye, ah, what's the company ever done for us? I'll hear no more of this. Captain Vanderland, you try to get us drunk and then propose that we desert our posts just when the colony is most threatened. Popish. Threatened by who, Lieutenant? By the great cop singer, you mean? <sighs> All this talk of cock singer is nothing more than wind and smoke. If Governor Coyote and the council decide that we are needed here, then here, sir, must we stay. Uh, Lieutenant, have you not heard the cock singer lost 500 jugs fighting the Tartars in Nanjing uh, with no fleet? How is he to bring his army here to Formosa on the backs of fishes? <laughs> <laughs> to subvert the orders of the council is treason, sir. It is my duty to report this. Treason? Uh, nay, old lieutenant, uh, you mistake me. No one here speaks treason. Then what were you proposing? Nothing, blast you. Nothing but a request to be submitted to the Governor-General in Batavia. Your Governor Coyette acts against the interests of us all when he invents these dangers. Damn it, the Governor is a coward. What's that? Strange, the ship rolls as though in a gale. But there's no wind. You hear that? It's a woman singing. Irene. I'll get to the bottom of this. I'm going on deck. On deck, the officers are shocked to see Taoyuan Bay transformed. Black smoke and kissing steam, underwater eruptions, gouts of fire beneath the waves. Behold, the mouth of hell. Oh, the beasts of the deep awake. Look there. It's it's a man. of the devil. She sings us to our death. Man the boat. Get us ashore. Every man for himself. and earthquakes that continue for seven months, no real harm is done. Vanderland returns to Batavia, and for a while, peace holds. Then, at daybreak on April 30th, 1661, the lookouts on the ramparts of Castle Zelandia spy an enormous flotilla of junks just outside Taoyuan Bay. Attack! It's Coxinga! Give the signal! Call Governor Coyette! There must be a thousand junks. He's brought his whole army with him. Steady, lad. Governor Coyette will know what to do. The five Dutch ships in the harbor make sail and prepare to do battle against overwhelming odds. Coxinga sends some of his junks to attack the castle directly from the sea, and others to land thousands of men on the beaches of Baxenboy. The rest of his fleet he sends toward Lake Smuiz Channel. Governor Coyette, Lieutenant Garrett, Captain Tittle, and the lookouts watch from the castle walls. Governor, the junks are maneuvering to blockade the deep waters of Lake Smuiz Channel. Coxinger evidently understands our position only too well. 
If he can control the panel, then the few ships we have will be trapped in the harbor. No, sir! Captain Hildor's ship, the Hector, has broken free. He's taking her out to the point towards the junks that are attacking the castle. I trust the castle's seaward defenses are holding, Sergeant. Aye, sir, no real danger there. But the men will be glad enough to have Captain Hildorf's assistance. And there's the Grabler. She blasted another junk. Looks like a hundred Chinese in the water. Let's hope Poxinger is one of them. Sir, look there. On the beach. It's the Chinese settlers from Sakem. Hundreds of them crossing to Baxenboy to welcome the enemy troops ashore. Governor Coyet. Yes, Captain Peddle? The mission to take my men to Baxenboy to repel the invaders, sir. There are 150 junks heading to Baxenboy, Captain. You realize you'll be facing an enemy force of several thousand men. Yes, sir. But they won't have tasted Dutch muskets before. And now it's time to attack. So, before they get totally dug in, a quick victory will send the whole pack of them running back to Amoy. It's a risky maneuver, Governor. Pedal's men will have to wait ashore from some distance out. And once they're on the beaches, it'll be hard to get them off again if anything goes wrong. Oh, that doesn't frighten me, sir. Captain Vanderland always said the Chinese made worse soldiers than the natives. Did he indeed? But I don't recall that Captain Vanderland ever had occasion to fight them. But it stands to reason, sir. They don't even have muskets, just bows and arrows and swords. Very well, Captain. Take 240 men and see what you can do. Our prayers go with you. Thank you, sir. Captain Pedal's mission does not go well. After firing only three volleys, he finds himself outnumbered and outflanked by Coxinga's well-disciplined troops. In a panic, his men throw down their muskets. Captain Pedal and half his men are killed, and the rest are taken prisoner. At sea, a fireboat sinks the Hector. The other Dutch vessels remain trapped in the harbor, all except the Maria, which slips past the blockade and sailing against the southern monsoon, sets out on the long and perilous journey to Batavia. Meanwhile, on land, Coxinga's army easily captures the city of Provincia. After the battle, Coxinga retires to a blue silk tent, and the Mandarin, Senge, brings before him the highest-ranking Dutch prisoner, Deputy Governor Jacob Valentin. Kneel down and knock your forehead on your earth that the low Kusinga can hear you. How dare you? I am your prisoner, sir, but I will not be treated like a slave. Noble Prince, I am Deputy Governor Jacob Valentin of the Netherlands and uh, 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 Red Hair Dort. Show respect or your life is forfeit. Tell me, Deputy Governor, are you fond of blue? Uh, what? I don't understand. Blue. The color. I always find blue so restful, so soothing. Wouldn't you agree? So soothing? Yes, but very. I had this blue tint especially made. It's silk, of course, and on a bright day becomes perhaps a little too pale. But at night, like this, lit only from within, it's quite... Perfect, don't you think? Oh, oh, yes, perfect. You see, Sange, I knew he'd agree. Deputy Governor Valentin is obviously a man of discernment and good taste. And I'm sure that, like me, he finds all this unpleasantness very disagreeable. Indeed, Excellency, we all of us deplore it. So many fine young men die, one presumes, in agony on the field of battle. Of course. I leave all the details to my generals. My strengths and interests lie elsewhere. And yet, of course, it still disturbs one. One cannot help but be upset by the proximity of such things. There, Sange, the deputy governor understands perfectly. And so, of course, if there's anything I could do to alleviate the situation... Sange tells me there is. Isn't that right, Sange? Oh, yes. Excellency. I expect he will have some questions for you later. First, though, I have composed several proclamations to be sent out to the villages. Come, you may help translate them for me. Thanks to Valentin's treacherous complicity, Fort Provincia falls. Oxinga's troops occupy the city of Zealandia, and the Dutch forces withdraw to Zealandia Castle, their last stronghold in Formosa. 
hoping that the besieged Dutch will surrender the castle intact, Coxinga sends Reverend Anthony Humbrook as his envoy to Governor Coyette and Chief Merchant Iberin. Anthony, I thank God you're still alive. But for you to come to us like this as Coxinger's messenger... There are worse things, Governor. How did you fall into his hands? When Coxinga attacked, we were at the new seminary in Sulon. At first, we continued our usual routine of prayers and instruction, but then we received a letter from Deputy Governor Valentin telling us to surrender to the nearest Chinese Mandarin. Word spread among the villagers that the Dutch had been defeated. So thinking to please their new masters, many of the natives turned against us. When they incited the scholars to destroy their books and quills, it was too much for Daniel Hendricks. Listening to a program in English from PCJ Radio International. Broadcasting to listeners in Southeast and East Asia on 137-20 kilohertz. And to listeners in Port Moresby and Papua New Guinea on 101.9 FM. For more information on PCJ Radio International, go to www.pcjmedia.com. Thank you for listening and have a good night.